So that's kind of where our banking, or not our banking, our monetary system is at right now. Um, so there are other system, economic systems out there, and some of them are being created as we speak. Um, I want to tell you guys about the Order of the Blue Lotus. Has anybody watched um, Avatar, The Last Airbender? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So there's this character, he is um, the Fire Lord's brother. And the Fire Lord is just wreaking havoc all across the world. Um, and it's not really relevant to what we're talking about today, but the brother is a good guy. And he's also a member of the Order of the Blue Lotus. And one of the White. perks, what? White. <gasps> it's not the Blue Lotus? It's the White Lotus. It's the White Lotus. Okay, I was wrong. Um, so he's a member of the Order of the Blue Lotus, or the White Lotus. And one of the perks of being a member of the secret society is that anywhere you go, if you hand them over a coin with the White Lotus on it, then you can get whatever you need. You can get housing, food, shelter, protection, goods, whatever you need, because you have this one token. And this is it from a cartoon, but that's actually happening today, and it's happened throughout history. Um, one of the ways that it's happening today is through decentralized systems. Um, so Bitcoin is a, is a form of decentralized monetary system. And what it does is, well, okay, so Bitcoin is built on something called the blockchain. And the blockchain is a digital or digital ledger system which uses verifi verifications from thousands and thousands of participants rather than keeping a record on one server like a bank does. There are thousands and thousands of participants that verify each record. And that automatically makes this particular system more foolproof because if 50,000 people show that Amanda has $100 in her bank account and one ledger register shows that Amanda owes somebody $100, the 50,000 the 50, verifications that Amanda has that money in her account is going to take precedent over that one ledger, meaning that nobody can go and rip off somebody and say, Oh, you owe me this money because it's, it doesn't show up in the in the transactions, um, and they call that redundant accuracy. So, anytime you make a transaction, it's verified by thousands and thousands of other people. Um, so the only way to override or hack that particular system is if you were if you manage to get more than 51% of all of the verified transactions to show that you were right. It would be a really hard, um, it's a really hard bar for a potential uh, bad actor to climb up or to get up to because they essentially would have to override the entire system with that many participants. Um, and it hasn't been done yet. I don't know that, I don't think that it'll ever be done. It, it, it's pretty impossible. So, which is why, which is what makes Bitcoin such a uh, stable currency. Um, there's another kind of uh, there's another company called Ethereum that uses blockchain also, but they don't use it as a monetary system. However, they have started coming. They have come out with their own to token that they call um, Ether. But Ethereum is a virtual city hall blockchain, and it's used as a way to create and verify contracts versus Bitcoin, which, is, which uses blockchain to create and record digital accuracy or digital currency. Um, and there's a pretty big popularity. So when one of these companies, there's thousands, by the way, there are thousands of digital currencies being started all the time. Um, and there's a large po popularity for it too, because people are looking at the dollar system, they're looking at, uh, 
the euro and they're seeing the instability in these countries and they're trying to find a way to kind of hedge their bets against um, what might be down the road for these countries and their currencies. Um, so when one of these when one of these publics goes or <laughs> when one of these products goes live, meaning they're ready to sell, it's called um, an initial coin offering, much like an uh, IPO, uh, initial product offering, like when somebody is trying to sell shares in their company. Um, an initial coin offering is what they call it for digital currency. But they have, um, I, we'll call them ICOs, have grown to account for more startup funding in blockchain-based companies than all of venture capital. So for new startup companies, this is where it's at. Everyone is hopping on board this blockchain, um, the blockchain train, I guess. Um, but nearly 2.3 billion has been raised to date in ICOs, and actually uh, this article is from 2017. So this is a pretty well-established um, market and the reason that I'm pointing that out is because I want people, I want you guys to know, like this isn't something that people are doing off in the, off in the ether, like, you know, that's never gonna be a real thing, never gonna be, uh, you know, something that might be available to us where we live. Um, it might not be Bitcoin, it might not be ether, but these things, like I said, there's thousands of them and they have huge popularity because of uh, the accuracy of their records. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears a little bit because I want to talk about China's social crediting system. Um, so recently I read an article about a journalist who had been trying to travel in China. Um, he's a Chinese journalist and his, uh, his movements were restricted because um, the reason that he was given was he had a uh, low social credit score. And the reason for that was that he had written an article that was um, critical of the Chinese government. So what that actually looks like, though, that, that sounds kind of crazy. Like the government being like, no, you can't take that train because we don't like what you said. But actually, 9 million Chinese have been banned from buying domestic flights, and uh, more than 3 million have been, buy, um, have been banned from buying business class tickets um, or being able to travel within the boundaries of their cities, even. Um, and again, it's for action. Or this. This happens because uh, the government in China determines whether or not your actions are um, of good social credit. Some of the actions that could cause your social credit to drop um, have been things like obstructing footpaths with electric bikes or failing to pay fines. So <clears throat> they're rolling out something called the 5G system. and. Um, if you're not familiar with 5G, what that is, it, um, is it's something akin to 4G, but it's on a different frequency pattern. So it's actually on the microwave wavelength of frequency. And there are all kinds of 5G products out there that um, are marketed to make your life easier, make your life more, um, more convenient. So this would be things like uh, televisions, refrigerators, toaster ovens, um, the uh, wireless systems in your car, eventually cell phones. Um, but the, the, really, uh, the really beneficial thing when governments are thinking about social credit is how all of these things um, distribute your, your data without anyone ever having to put any effort into it. Nobody has to 
go to your Facebook page and see what kind of information you have on there, what kind of interactions you've had. Nobody has to, um, you know, hack into your Safeway account to see how often you buy beer or anything like that. Like, you don't have to do that because all of these, comp or all of these um, products just supply that information automatically through the 5G network. So if you buy too much beer, or maybe you were in bed with your wife last night and you had a conversation that your Alexa picked up, or your Bixby, or what's the other one called? Echo is another one. Um, if you have a conversation that maybe doesn't seem very supportive to the government, you can, your credit score can drop. Um, and that's what they're doing in China, right? It's already rolled out. That's, and really the crazy thing about it is that the government doesn't tell the Chinese citizens what their social credit score is, which encourages them to always be on their best behavior and also to um, shun people who might be considered to be doing something that would be against the government standard for high social credit. So that's going on in China right now. Um, another way that blockchain is being used, remember blockchain is the ledger system that provides accuracy um, whether you have physical documents or not. So. Um, the Azraq Syrian uh, refugee camp, this is in Jordan, it's in the Jordanian desert, um, and there's about 35 Syrian refugees that live there. Um, these are people who have left war zones, so they don't have an I any identifying papers, they don't have any bank statements or cell phones in many cases. They don't have ways to keep track of their family members. They don't have any ways to verify who they are. Um, and we kind of take that for granted because we have social security numbers and driver's license and birth certificates and we have established relationships within, within our communities. Um, when I go to curry masala, Alan knows me. I've been coming there for 11 years. He knows my face, he knows who I am. These people who are in this foreign refugee camp don't have any of that. They don't know that the people that they live next to, um, the authority that rules over the camp is Jordanian, so it's a foreign authority to them. They have no um, advocate or um, any way to prove that they are socially um, in good standing. Nobody knows who they are. They don't have any ties or relationships other than hopefully the people that they came with. Um, so they are currently um, the humanitarian aid that this camp at um, Azraq receives is um, through a voucher system. So this is good because it can it shows that or it shows that people are able to go to a market they're able to spend money how they want um, to buy supplies that they need but it's also bad because um, anyone could rob them for their vouchers at any time um, and there's no there's no way to prove that people haven't used their or there aren't there's no way to prove that people aren't using their vouchers more than once um, so it's created kind of a distrust economy within this camp. Um, but using decentralized systems uh, to build social credit and ensure proper use of credit and to protect against predators um, is the main goal for the World Food Program. So what they've done is they've taken 10,000 of these 35,000 refugees and they've put them on this blockchain um, ledger system to help keep track of what they uh, or what they own, um, when they got it, when they obtained it, um, who they traded it to, and for what. And this is creating a community of trust within this um, refugee camp that really doesn't have a chance to do that otherwise. Um, so that's another way that blockchain is being used. Um, 
so I don't know that I think that blockchain is the future. I don't know that I think that it's like the answer to all of our problems, but I have seen s enough ways that it's been used to benefit um, the people, not just a few, that I'm really hopeful. I'm really, I'm really hoping that we can find a way to put power back in the hands of the people as opposed to leaving it up to this kind of ruling class that thinks that they have it all figured out for us and they know what we want and what we need. Um, so there's a few different examples of how blockchain might help us do that.